that's the question. Are you a spectator or are you actually following Jesus? This is what we're going to dive into headfirst today. If you saw the video before that, though, it was the Christ Together of Greater Indianapolis, all of these churches working together. And so God has allowed us to be a part of pioneering that in this city. Let me tell you what has happened over the course of a year. From the first time that we sat down together around the table and I asked these guys to come around the table, the idea was, hey, we're here just to hear what this means, but honestly, we're not that in, in, um, interested in actually doing anything together. To where this Sunday, us, Greenwood Christian, and Emmanuel are all starting the same series in our city on discipleship. Is that amazing? Like, I know that for some of you, you're like, yeah, that's cool. Like, let me just tell you how amazing this is. This has never happened in our city before. Churches joining together for the same mission intentionally together, and we're all preaching this on spiritual formation to drive this deeper into discipleship into our group. So now let me ask it a question again. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Okay. So what is going to come out of this is we're all going to be in our group structure. We're going to be working towards the same goal this year, and we're going to be doing more and more things as churches together that we will be able to be involved in. God is absolutely amazing and incredible. And so we just, I just want to thank him for this. We're going to pray and thank him for this because Jesus actually prayed this prayer in John 17 that people, his followers, would be known by their unity and that they would actually be unified together. And it is actually happening in our city, church. This is unbelievable. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. God, we love you. We thank you so much for a time of deep division, uh, deep disunity. Uh, and Lord, just scattered lives everywhere. We thank you so much that you are still at work. You're still moving and mending hearts towards unity and towards you, Jesus. And so I pray right now for all these pastors who are standing on their stages this week, uh, specifically for Matt Giebler and Danny Anderson, who we are all preaching this exact same thing. But I pray for Brock and Ken as they're preaching similar to this, God. Um, that you would just unify their bodies today more than they've ever seen, that you would knit our churches, your churches together more than we've ever seen, God. And we just want to give you the praise and the glory for this. And so, God, we pray for the people right now who want to be here, but they're sick, they're down, they're probably frustrated, maybe a little bit depressed and not understanding why they can't just get out of uh, the sickness and get out of the things that they're dealing with, God. We want to pray for them right now. Don't let the enemy have any place in their life. And Father, I pray that as they're watching online, they're engaged with us today. They know that we love them, we're praying for them, and we can't wait to see them back. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's that time of year again for resolutions. How many of you do these every year? Let's see it. Okay, how many of you want to do them every year? Dang, you guys are very unmotivated. <laughs> 2022, this should be like some good stuff, people. Come on. Well, let me just read some statistics because these actually tell us where we are. The question I'm asking today, spectator, is dating or committed? Okay, now we're not talking about relationships today, but it's going to give us a good understanding of where we're going. But it's resolution time. Again, let's see how we do as a society. 94% of Americans believe they will fail at their resolution by the 30-day mark. Now I know why you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> But 46% of people will actually see their resolution through. It's pretty good. But of the group of people that won't, 70% of them will actually give up sooner than that. <laughs> There's the reality. Here's the reasons they listed. 52% say they lack the self-discipline to stay on track. 43% say their schedule is too busy to keep the resolution. And 41% say that they feel too much societal pressure to keep the change that they have started because nobody else is doing it around them, right? So here are the top 10 resolutions that seem to make the list every single year. Let's see if any of these have been on there for you. Number one and number two, exercise more, lose weight. Anybody? Good? Yeah? Okay, good. There's some motivation. Get organized. Learn a new skill or hobby. I don't even know what this means. Live life to the fullest. Anybody have a definition for that? Like, fullest of what? what? What are we living? Anyways, I'll move on. Save more money? It's subjective. Quit smoking? Does anyone still smoke? Don't raise your hand. Good Lord. All right. For the love, quit smoking. Move that to the number one, please. We love you. Cigarettes are expensive and they're disgusting. Spend more time with family. I used to smoke, so I can say that. Get off me. Travel more. <laughs> Read more. Okay? That's our top ten list. All right? So... Interesting statistic, though. 
46% of people who make a resolution solution see it through, where only 4% will accomplish goals if they don't make a resolution. Now, I'm going to give you one more chance to raise your hand to see if you're going to make a resolution. How many of you are going to make a resolution this year? Come on, come on, come on. I've set you up really well here, okay? Because 46% of you that make a resolution will actually keep it. That's pretty good. Let's put this into perspective of our church, okay? Let's say that 100% of us in here today watching online, we decide we are going to be more spiritually formed people, okay? If only half of us finish 22 more like Jesus, that's pretty good. Would you agree? You want to raise your hand again? Okay, let's try this one more time. How many of you want to do a resolution this year? All right. The rest of you are dead to me. All right. I tried as hard as I could. <laughs> okay. This series is called Spectator. By definition, the word spectator is a person who is present and views a spectacle display or the like or a member of an audience. You guys are spectating to some degree this morning. My wife has taken her dad to the Colts game today after church for his Christmas present. They will be spectators at the game. There is a very sharp contrast between the people on the field and the people spectating that no one would ever think of mixing those two crowds of people together. Teams have four and five strings deep in their position. So let's say that all of the quarterbacks get hurt today from the Colts. We're not going to wish that. We're going to pray the otherwise. So let's say that they do. What is not going to happen is their coaches are not going to get the binoculars out, start looking through the crowd and go, hey, section two, row 34, he just threw a beer, good spiral tight, get him down here. <laughs> it's not going to happen, okay? What happens is those two crowds don't mix because some are on the field playing, some are on the sideline spectating. Why is there such a big disconnect between player and spectator? One is trying and one is training. We were at Circle Center Mall yesterday, um, probably for the last time because it's closing down. It's super sad. There's a massive store in there called Fandom. You can buy anything you want for any team that you want to go and spectate for your favorite team. Now, trying really hard, I can know every statistic of every player, especially my favorite ones, but that will never, ever get me on the field. They are never going to call me up to come run the ball in and live out my dream of playing in the NFL. It's not going to happen if I just try hard and I am the best spectator and I know all of the statistics about all of the things that I want to be. And the biggest difference is me sitting in the stands and paying to watch or me being there and somebody paying to watch me is trying hard or training hard. Now, statistically, this is a very elite group of people that are going to be on that field today. Because a very small percentage of them, no matter how hard we all train, would ever make it to that. But the beauty of not being a spectator in God's kingdom is everybody can actually make it on the field. Isn't that amazing? Because we don't have to spectate, but we get caught in the trap of trying really hard when we actually should just be training really hard. See, spectators... They try really hard. They are the best coaches, and if they were playing in the game, their team would have won. Ever said that about your team? Come on, coach, you're ridiculous. If I was coaching, this team would be champions. Anybody? <laughs> you, if you ran that ball, you would not have fumbled. You would have actually got it in. Let's just be honest. Stay in your lazy boy and keep your comments to yourself, okay? <laughs> Players, they're actually training to be on the field and in the game. They're disciplined, intentional, and everything they do surrounds their training because it is their entire life. <clears throat> One of my friends actually just retired from the Raiders this year. We went to lunch, and he's so disciplined that he ordered his food to go so he could go home and weigh it out and be perfectly precise because he was in season at the time. It's called discipline at the highest level. And it's a difference between trying really hard and guessing what he should have eaten or being training really hard, taking it home, weighing it out, and eating perfectly what he should have. And it's a really big difference. 46% of people who make a resolution will actually see it through. Here's my question for you. Will you resolve with me to go on a spiritual formation journey for 2022? 
Because remember, even if only half of us make it to the end of 22, we will be more spiritually formed like Jesus, and that has the ability to majorly change things in your life and our city, church, and that is really exciting to me. So what are we talking about in the terms of following Jesus? There is a huge difference in believing and following, and this is where I want you to start thinking about your life. I would be confident in saying that 100% of you that call yourselves followers of Jesus would say you believe in Jesus. Where we're going to draw a line, though, is if you have moved over to the other side and you're actually following him. Because the biggest disconnect in spiritual formation is knowledge about him. I can be a fan. I can be a spectator. I can know every statistic about everyone on that field I can know every verse. I can know every time Jesus references this in the Bible. I can know all of the things I'm supposed to do here, but that does not mean I'm following Jesus. I can absolutely be a very highly well-educated spectator. And what we want to do is we want to cross that line over, and we want to now ask the question, are you actually following him? Because there's a really big difference. Now, this is still hard for us to pull down into some tangible form. So let's, let me give you an example. When you meet the one, you start the process with a conversation. Nowadays, it starts with a DM, typically. You start hanging out, then it's more and more, and then you want to make it official, so you commit to that person as the one you are now with exclusively, okay? You've moved away from dating other people, and you're now committed to this person, Fast forward, you marry this person, you have an incredible ceremony, you stand on a stage like this when you give heartfelt vows, everybody cries, this is going to be an amazing wedding, you head off to the honeymoon. The first night you walk down to the beach because your spouse is asleep and you're taking it all in, you're excited about your new marriage, you're in a beautiful place celebrating your honeymoon, and you run into a person who's really attractive and you start talking to them and before you know it, you're sleeping with them. You go back up to the room, you climb into bed and you go to sleep and the next morning your spouse can tell something is different you reluctantly tell them what happened, but you passionately follow up with, I'm fully committed to you, though, nobody else. Why are you upset? And I think all of us would agree that person is not very committed to their spouse. Why does there seem to be such a huge disconnect in those who believe and those who follow? In marital relationships, we would never agree we are exclusively committed to our spouse if we continually played the field and kept our options open. Yet it seems to be pretty standard when it comes to people and their relationship to Jesus. Their relationship isn't exclusive to Jesus, yet they're convinced they're committed to him and following him. Spectators and those disciplined and training hard to be on the field for Jesus is a very big difference. So, Harvard Business Review did a study of connectedness in the workplace, and this is why I'm going to tell you why it's so difficult for us to move from believing to following. Social belonging is a fundamental human need hardwired into our DNA, and yet 40% of people say they feel isolated at work. The result has been lower organizational commitment and engagement, and in a nutshell, companies are blowing it. Look at this slide. U.S. businesses spend nearly $8 billion each year on diversity and inclusion trainings that miss the mark because they neglect their need to feel included. $8 billion on training to include people, yet their workers don't feel included because they don't give them a sense of what to belong to. Exclusion is damaging because it actually hurts. The sensation is akin to physical pain, and it's a sting we've all experienced at one time or another. To feel left out is a deeply human problem, which is why the consequences carry such heft and why its causes are so hard to root out. Look at this slide. Humans are so fundamentally social that we can even bond with strangers over the very experience of not having anyone with whom to bond. Did you guys ever see the kids in school or wherever it is that you hang out that are different than everybody else? They're like, yeah, I'm a loner, man. Come over here and be a loner with me. Like, wait, what? <laughs> because we have such a need to belong that we are willing to stand out with other people who just want to belong, even though they're not like anybody else. 
Why is it so hard for us to be spiritually formed? Because we just want to belong. So when we look around and we go, that guy's following Jesus. He's serious. He's passionate. That lady, nothing rattles her because she is in love with Jesus. I'm going to follow her. I'm going to match up to her. And then we look and we look and we look and we go, ooh, this one posted a Facebook post about a member of her. Let me watch this. Oh, no, nope, I don't even think that lady's a Christian. Never mind. That was a joke because you know how Facebook is and it's probably you. No, I don't stalk you, but it's easier. Why is it? easier to just believe than to follow. Because 98% of the people you interact with on a daily basis don't follow Jesus. And with our desire to belong and fit in, it makes it really difficult to follow him. Super easy to believe in him. Really difficult to follow him. We are creatures of habit and we want to belong. For us to stand out in a crowd and be isolated away from everybody else is not natural to most of us. I am okay not being in a crowd. My wife hides behind me when that happens because she is not okay being out of a crowd and in front of people. But God's made me different. He's made me a very odd individual. <laughs> And that's okay, because you need weird people to stand in front of you and tell you to get out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah. See, what happens is, is the way that God wires the majority of humanity is we like to be involved with people that like what we like and do what we do. And ironically, I'm involved with a bunch of other pastors, so I'm not by myself and I'm not standing out. I have my group too. But what I want you to know is this is hardwired in us so deeply that we will go to any length to not stand out. And so when I stand up here and I tell you, there's a difference between believing and there's a massive difference in what God called us to, to follow Jesus. You're already really nervous right now because it goes against everything inside of you to go, wait, you want me to step to a different side of a line no one's at, or at least very few people are? Yeah, I do. On behalf of Jesus, I do, because this is what he has called us to. But see, I think part of the problem is, is what we're actually rescued from. Now, let's say that you're in a crowded mall parking lot and your tire goes flat and 50 people come to help you. Doesn't seem like a big rescue. But let's say that you're on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean, you fall over the side, and then there's nobody around, and you're floating in the middle of the ocean with this little orange inner tube, and then all of a sudden, two or three days later, some boat comes by, dramatically rescues you, sets you free, you tell your story, it's amazing, and that's a massive rescue. You're going to talk about that rescue. I'm not going to talk about 50 people coming to help me change my tire. Because in the middle of the ocean, I was rescued from a lot. I was about to die. People were looking for me. People were worried for me. And somebody came and snatched me out of that ocean where I didn't think I had any chance. And what happens is, is when we see Jesus for who he is and we realize what we were actually rescued from, here's the problem. We don't want to admit how bad we actually are, how much we were actually forgiven for. You know why? Because we don't like to face our past. We don't like to look and see our sin for what it is. And so we were like, yeah, I know Jesus forgave me, but whatever. He forgave everybody else too. There's billions of Christians in this world, right? And so then what we do is we play this like, you know what? Yeah, I was forgiven, but... And then we can just continue to play games with what that rescue actually looked like. But we're going to look at a story today where Jesus actually catches one of these religious guys and he asks him a question that he has to answer that we're going to see if we can answer too. See, the Pharisees hated Jesus and they were always looking for ways to trip him up. Jesus had just finished preaching and the crowd that is in the Pharisees' house was there. So one of them invited Jesus into his house to try to find some dirt on him. So let's go to Luke chapter 7 and we're going to look at several verses there today to see what we're talking about today in this idea of spiritual formation. Now, this lady that we're going to encounter here, we think that based on another gospel, she was at this preaching Jesus did and that she was just set free from her sin. Now, she's a prostitute. She's a woman of the night, they called her. 
So she is very, very degraded and looked down upon in society. She literally moved around at night. She was not welcome in any circles during the day. And so socially, she was very, very unaccepted. The Pharisee, on the other hand, when they would walk into town, people would revere them. They would see them and they would, they would step aside and they would, oh, here they come, the most holy people that we have in our city. And then here, let's pick this up in verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him, that's Jesus, to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. Now, I want to give you a little bit of perspective about this. I, I think this woman probably had been saving up to try to get out of this lifestyle. Think about a single mom who does something that she doesn't really want to do to get past a bad situation, okay? This is what we're going to kind of understand about this lady today. And I think probably one of the gifts that was given to her was a really, really expensive jar of perfume, an alabaster jar that would have come from the, the city of alabaster. It was a very rare stone that all this perfume would have been kept in. Very, very sensitive. In fact, could have gotten her out of the lifestyle she was in. Look at this statistic. That jar would have actually been worth $72,000 today. Now put this into perspective. You're in a load of debt. You're in a lifestyle you don't like. And you actually have the ability to get out. This today, this would get you out of a lot of things. For most of us, this would pay off our debt, pay our house down to a degree that we could, man, we could settle on everything. We could live comfortably. And yet she held on to that precious thing as it was going to be her savior. But then she collided with somebody named Jesus as she's sitting in this crowd and she's hearing him preach about forgiveness of all sin, even hers. What this does is it motivates her to go home and get her prized possession, something worth $72,000 to come in and anoint the feet of the one who set her free because she now believed in Jesus and she is now following him based on this offering to him. Now, I want you to understand the significance of this. Imagine being Jesus. He knew exactly how much that was worth. He knew exactly what she was doing. He did not stop her. Because as she realized, I am forgiven for so much. Let's see the Pharisee's response on the other side. When the Pharisee who had invited him in saw this, he said to himself, this phraseology in the Greek means he said this under his breath like, gosh, this guy's an idiot. Here's what he says, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Like this would have been his pharisaical, I am holier than this woman. I can't believe she's in my house. And if this guy was who he says he was, he would realize what kind of woman is actually touching him. She's disgusting. He would have never associated himself with her. In fact, if he would have gone into any part of the city where she was at, he would have had her removed from his area. So Jesus replied, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor has two debtors, one who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? That seems like a really easy question, right? 500 denarii, 50, pretty easy question, right? Well, let's look at the response of the Pharisee. Simon answered, and I mean, I suppose the one he forgave more. Does that not sound like a smart aleck? Like you just want to throat punch the guy? I mean, I suppose the guy with the bigger debts. <laughs> Jesus goes on and does not throat punch him, but he says, you have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said, Simon, 
do you see this woman? And my guess is like Jesus is turned and he's facing the woman, Simon's behind him. He's kind of turning back and he's looking at him and he's addressing this woman. He says, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, which was customary. The roads were dirty, had animal dung all over them. When you entered somebody's house, they gave you water to wash their feet. If they were wealthy, a servant came and washed them for you. But she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. A woman's hair was a prized possession to her. So two prized possessions she has given up and laid bare at the feet of Jesus. Something that was able for her to sell and get out of this lifestyle, to move away, to start a new life for her. She broke that jar over the feet of Jesus to anoint him. She wept so deeply with her tears, not because they found out who she was, but because he forgave her of who she was. And so it moved her so deeply that she wept and she wept and she would have pulled her hair down and cleaned the feet of Jesus with this. He goes on to say, you gave me no kiss, which is a customary greeting, but she can't stop kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who has forgiven little loves little. I want you to contemplate that verse for a minute. See, Simon, this Pharisee, at a young age, he would have learned word for word five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Very intelligent, very spiritual, very wise. As he came into town, they would tie bells and other things to make noises around the bottom of their robes so when they walked, everybody knew that they were coming because they were really important people. So they wanted to flag you that, hey, here I come, pay attention. It says that Jesus goes on to say that they liked the best seats in the house of worship, that they looked down on people that were under them that they wouldn't even allow people who were homeless or sinners to be up near the throne room of God, and that they kept all of the best for themselves. And I guarantee that this very intelligent Pharisee was not even registering what Jesus was saying. But I want to make sure that we do. He says, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Now, he doesn't then pause and go, you have just as many, Simon, even though that's true. So let's pause for a second. Here's why I think for us, believing is so much easier than following. You want to know why? All I have to do is find one person I'm doing better than spiritually, and I feel okay. I can look around. I can go to social media. I can be in close proximity to someone. I can see how they treat their wife, and I can go, well, I don't do that. I'm pretty good. I can be close and I can watch somebody react a certain way and go, well, I don't do that, so I'm pretty good. And what we do is we have this measuring stick that we find nowhere in Scripture that allows us to feel like we are on a journey of spirituality towards Jesus because we believe him and we're not as bad as that guy. We're not as bad as that lady. We're doing pretty good. And this is how Simon would have been standing in his own home I am confident not registering at all what Jesus was saying to him. Let me just make this clear to you, church. If you're sitting in here and you're an incredibly disciplined and religious person and you've sinned one time in your life, you still need this amount of forgiveness. Because it doesn't matter the amount of sin, it matters its sin. God is perfect. There was a debt of sin that was put on humanity. It all had to be paid, whether it's your one or my one trillion. <laughs> they all had to be paid, and I can't pay that debt for even one sin. And so the fact that this woman, whose sins are so numerous were forgiven and the weight of her heart was lifted off of her. And she just wept and wept and said, I want to give my most prized possession because you've given me one. 
So many of her sins were forgiven, so she loved so deeply. And Simon, standing there, not even registering his sin, I'm sure smugly was just like, let's just get on with the meal and get out of my house. Because a lot of times we don't see ourselves in the same position as people lower than us. But I just want you to imagine, remove all the people from your life, and I just want you to look Jesus in the face, just you and him, and then see how well that bodes for you. Because this is the Savior. This is the one we compare to. Not because we're trying to live perfectly, but because he is our mark, and he's the one who forgave us and set us free. So if I don't have to compare myself to any of you, first off, that frees me up incredibly. But second, I don't have to compare myself to anybody. Jesus says, I'm the one who gives you your status and your forgiveness. I'm the one who sets you free and makes you an heir to this throne. I'm the one who went and paid the penalty on the cross. You're just the recipient of it. You don't have to compare yourself to anybody. So the fact that Jesus is asking us to move from believing to following to step outside of a crowd, it should free us to go, I don't even care who doesn't like me anymore. I don't even care who disassociates with me at work. I don't even care how many followers I lose online. I'm following Jesus because he forgave me much. And then you understand this, but the one who is forgiven little loves little if we're just believing, at some degree, that is our category because we have forgotten what we were set free from. Let's finish up. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. So those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Could you imagine how freely she left that day? The weight that was lifted off of her as she walked back out on that same street she came in as a wretch of society and people looked at her differently and she could just smile and look at them in the face and be like, man, your judgment now means nothing to me. I'm forgiven. I'm set free. I want you to look at this. One saved from sin by love is softened by love. But one kept from sin by pride is hardened by pride. If you're sitting in here today and you're hearing the things that I'm saying, but it's not really registering to you, like I, I need you to sit with this for a minute. One saved from sin by love is softened by love. See, the Bible is really clear that it's the love of Christ that compels us towards him. It's the love of Christ that actually draws us to him. Now, I'm going to take you back to the day of your salvation. For those of you in this room who have surrendered their life to Christ, those of you watching online who have surrendered your life to Christ, I'm using very specific words for a reason. Our relationship with Jesus starts here. We understand that we can actually be set free. I mean, I just want you to think about the things that just plague your life right now. The things that even if you're a follower of Jesus, you still deal with. They're frustrating to you. They make you so angry. You keep doing them. Those things, okay? I want you to just come to that realization moment with you and Jesus where he said, I know, I know all of those. You can't save you, Mike. And so at that moment... I move from this tightly gripped hold on my life to opening my hands to the reality of Jesus, to turning them over and surrender and saying, my life, my wife, my sons, my money, everything I have, it's all yours. I surrender. Now, in our culture and society, that is a massive sign of weakness you've lost but we don't operate in this society as followers of Jesus. We operate out of God's currency in his kingdom. And he says when surrender happens, that is when I can now rescue you. 
If I'm floating in the middle of the ocean on that orange tube and a boat comes by and throws me a boat, somebody comes and goes, hey, man, there's food on here. There's water. Let's get you out. And I'm like, I'm, I'm actually waiting on somebody to rescue me, but I appreciate you guys stopping by. <laughs> Let my wife know I'm good. I'll be home when somebody rescues me. Like, what? Bro, you've been in the sun a long time. Get in the boat. <laughs> Like, there's, there's this surrender in rescue. I'm not going to fight that guy to rescue me. I'm going to turn everything over and go, yes, yes, please help me out. Get me out of here. And this is the same understanding and concept of our salvation with Jesus. We have no part in it except to surrender. He's the one who went to the cross. He's the one who bore the weight of sin on his back. He's the one who died. He's the one who went in the tomb. He's the one who rose three days later. And he is the one who offers us salvation if we will surrender our life to him. And then, because you're drawn by that love... You can be softened by that love, and you can say, this world is now no longer my home. I'm going to follow you, Jesus, no matter what that costs me. That was the day of your salvation. Excited, passionate, and on fire. But some of you have moved over to this other side, where we forget that day, and our pride is going to continue to harden our hearts to go, my belief in Jesus is enough. And I just want to give you a personal warning. That does not go well. Because I lived that life. And I was publicly broken by God. I promise you, whatever it is that you're holding on to, whatever it is that you think is worth more to you than your salvation and following Jesus and standing out in crowds, I promise you it's not worth it. I would even beg the Holy Spirit right now to break your heart so heavily for whatever it is that you would be holding on to that it just moves you to something you've never experienced or felt before. I, I pray that he just breaks you and he moves you to tears so you can see that love that drew you once to him. So the question is, church, will you commit to following Jesus, being with Jesus and becoming like him and doing what he did? This is where we're headed for 2022. The biggest disconnect in most followers of Jesus is they believe in him, but they don't follow him. We want to change that. It's what God, in fact, called us to do. So there's two groups of people sitting in the room this morning, those who are following Jesus and those who are not yet following Jesus. Now, those of you that are, let me just talk to you for a minute. This means you've come to the point in your life You've turned your hands over, you've surrendered, and you said, I will follow you. Here's what I can tell you about Jesus. He actually expected you to keep that commitment. He didn't expect you to try hard. He expected you to train hard. He expected you to now train to live your life a different way. It's called discipleship. In fact, we call it apprenticeship. It's seeing what another person does and then doing that. And so we're apprentices of Jesus. And so let me just ask you, how are you doing with that? Look back over the course of 2021 and just say, am, have I been with Jesus? Am I becoming like Jesus? And am I doing what Jesus did? Now, let me just say, you can scale these things. If there's been forward movement, great. Keep moving forward. If you can look back and you would honestly say, man, I just feel like I stalled. I went backwards. I didn't move towards him at all. Also great as long as you admit that and then confess that and then stop doing that. Because God says, I'm here at my throne. I'm ready to forgive Run to me. I will wrap my arms around you. I'll give you grace and mercy in your time of need. I'll forgive you. Let's move on. But church, I want you to know, you will look Jesus in the face one day and he will ask you, did you believe or did you follow? And I want you to be able to say, I followed you, Jesus. So if you're not, make today the day. 
For those of you in this room that are not followers of Jesus, and you're watching online, you're not followers of Jesus, I, I get where you're at. I'm a skeptic by nature, and I understand you may have a thousand questions, and I'm so happy to try to answer those for you. We have a team of people here who are really smart and would love to try to walk through that with you. Just please ask. Don't dismiss today. Understand what God is drawing you towards. It's his love that is drawing you right now. He wants a relationship with you. Will you surrender to him? Here's how we close. Our band is going to make their way back up. We're going to sing one more song. This is an opportunity for you to respond. That's why we do this. So there's going to be a few people over there at that couch section. There's going to be people that are scattered out across the back. All of our leaders are going to go ahead and move there now. And here's why we do this. Because you cannot do this alone. So we need you to go talk with somebody who is in the back or over here and go, I need help. I, I, I think I want to follow Jesus. I don't know. I have a bunch of questions. Can we just talk about this? Or, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus and I have been blowing it. What do I do? Would you help me? This is why we station these people around the room. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to just be very honest with the status of where you are with your relationship. As a Christian, are you believing or are you following? If you're a Christian, I'm confident of your belief. The question then becomes, are you following? Or are we spectating? Here's what I can tell you. I'm sure you feel bad about yourself right now. Let me just speak to that. I want you to feel what's called contrition. It's the weight of our sin. We have to feel the weight of sin in order to move past sin. Because if you're like, yeah, I uh, wasn't such a great follower of Jesus this year, but okay, I'm ready. Like, it's probably not going to mean too much to you, but I, I, I do want you to feel the weight of sin. I want you to feel the heaviness that you did walk away, that you moved from following to belief, or that you just always believed. But the worst thing you can do is stay there. The worst thing you can do is stay in that feeling because Jesus says, now with that weight, come to me. I will give you the rest you're looking for. I will forgive you. We will walk shoulder to shoulder and I will set you free. So it would be a major travesty if you just sat in, man, I'm so worthless. I'm such a loser. I can't believe I'm here again. That would be horrible, church. Don't stay there. Move past it today. God, I pray that as we sing and we worship one last song, that we can actually be set free from just believing and move to following. This is where we actually find freedom. This is where we find true community. This is where we find belonging. This is where we find what we've been looking for. We love you and we ask the things in your son's name. Amen. Would you guys